Welcome to a special episode of Marriage News Watch. I'm Matt Baum with the American Foundation for Equal Rights, and I'm so pleased to welcome Alan Shane and Norman Sunshine, authors of the new book, Double Life, a love story from Broadway to Hollywood. Over their 50-year relationship, uh, their adventures together have brought them from struggling on Broadway to running Warner Brothers Television, from small illustration gigs to winning an Emmy, and in recent years to confronting the possibility of marriage at last. Alan and Norman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for letting us be with you. Well, you have so many amazing stories in your book, it's hard to know where to start. I wonder if you could just begin by telling the story of how you met in 1958. I'll start that one. Uh, as you know, I opened the chapter with getting a phone call, but I'm uh, trying to concentrate on my work. And it's uh, a man whose wife has uh, just gotten sick, and so he has this extra ticket to see uh, Jamaica with Lena Horne and Ricardo Montalban. And so, of course, I'm dying to go there, so I do, and we're sitting in the balcony, and the announcer announces that uh, Ricardo Montalban will not play today, it will be Alan Shane, and everyone groans, and, you know, we looks to get out of there, but however, the orchestra comes up real fast, and Alan is the first thing that appears on the stage, quite buff, uh, very worked out, kind of bare chested, and then he is on this little boat, and he sings to this little cottage, uh, Savannah, Savannah opened the shutters to I remember the lyrics to that thing. And out comes Lena Horn and jumps into his arms, and that's Alan. And then they play throughout the whole thing quite wonderfully. And Alan is charming, and it's a nice voice, and he's able to pull his own with Lena Horn, which was also amazing. And then my friend says, I know this guy. You know, he's, I, he's also a television actor. And he said, let's go back and congratulate him. So we do go back and congratulate him. And I'll just do this real fast, because Alan was... In a, in a kind of bikini with this man putting black makeup on his body because this was the matinee that was going on in the evening, so they were making about the evening the show, and he was rather grand. He was on a little platform, very, very high, and kind of talking over everyone, and I kind of, I wasn't sure I liked him because he seemed kind of overbearing, you know, and full of himself. So that's the first impression I got. Okay, Alan. Well, for me to play that kind of role was very difficult. I wasn't really a singer, I wasn't really a dancer, and I wasn't a native. This was a show with all natives. Ricardo, at least, was Mexican. But I was in virtually what was blackface in those days. I was made up very dark. I'd had to dye my hair dark. And in order to get through the groans from the audience and the groans from the, the cast who didn't you know, particularly want me to, they wanted Ricardo to be there, because when the audience groaned, they felt badly too. So I just had to psych myself up and act as if I were a star. And when I'd come off a performance, as I did when I met Norman for the first time, I was still very high. I still was trying to be this great star in order to get through the performance. So I really wasn't very nice with Norman, and yet I was just fascinated by him. I'd never seen anybody who looked like that. And I wanted very much to know him, but it all kind of went wrong in the dressing room, and I figured I'd never see him again. But after that, we just ran into each other everywhere, in subways, on the street. And how we got together, of course, is in the book. And I, I don't want to spoil that. What was, when, when you were meeting each other and, and forming your relationship initially, what was your understanding then of what it was to be a gay couple? Well, we didn't really... Uh, we didn't really know many gay couples, and the few we did meet, we didn't really care much about. Either they kept house, and one was the man, one was the woman, and one cooked, and the other ate. And I don't know. It didn't seem like a very attractive situation to us, because we were both, both had careers, and we, no one wanted to be a, a famous illustrator, and then finally an artist, and I wanted to be a big Broadway star. So we were both very ambitious, and both and kind of equal in that sense. And there was no attempt at any kind of role playing because we didn't know that. Also, there was no real roadmap for what, what was happening to us. We didn't have role models in those days because we didn't know people who had good, equal relations, men or women, I'm talking about now same sex, didn't have equal relationships and that's what we wanted. And as a relationship uh, uh, developed, it was really out of the sense of interest in each other, friendship, of encouragement for each other. It was very much a kind of um, building that was being built from the foundation of uh, whatever the sexual attraction was, was something else, and that was very, very nice. That also evolved into something, until something I believe called love evolved. 
and we wanted to be with each other all the time. But it took us a long time to decide to live together, because in those days it was, for me as an actor, I couldn't really live with another man. If they found out that I was gay, I wouldn't be sent out on most roles. So it was a very difficult time, and we didn't have examples around us to see that it was possible. It was two years before we could actually think of living together. I mean, it just... And parents and relatives and friends, I mean, how do you explain this? In those days, we never spoke of it. So. Now we're talking about it all the time. It's a whole different world. Now, you were both working as artists when you met. Um, Alan is an actor, Norman is an illustrator. Was there a degree of openness that the arts afforded you, or, or did you still need to remain closeted? Well, in, in terms of my work, yes. I mean, after all, Andy Warhol was evolving off. There were a lot of gay artists around. So it wasn't as big a deal. It was not until I went into advertising that, and I started handling clients and dealing with lots of money, that I had to be much more uh, circumspect about the whole thing. In Alan's case... Well, I was an actor, and you couldn't really be known as gay as an actor, as I, as I said. They would only send you out for eccentric roles. They wouldn't send you out for a leading, young leading role. So I had affairs with women, and uh, was usually seen with a woman, until Norman, and then I, actually I left acting, and one of the reasons was that I wanted to be more with Norman, and I felt we could be freer in our life. As long as I was an actor and had a relationship with him, it, we could not really have an open life. You know, it seems, <laughs> it seems like that's, that's still somewhat the case. I mean, there have been actors now that have come out of the closet, but my impression is that there's still a lot of pressure in show business for actors to remain, to, to not talk about themselves. There's no question about that, and especially, I think, for leading men or leading women. They, I mean, the few people who've come out, I think, are wonderful, have great courage, and they're managing their careers very well. Ellen DeGeneres is extraordinary, what she's done. And the country loves her. You know? And when I was in Hollywood as president of Warner's Television, we lived together because we've always lived together for the last 48 or 50 years, whatever. But we didn't make a deal out of it. We didn't shove it into people's faces. Uh, and finally, uh, when they were considering whether I would be president of Warner Television, there was a lot of talk about whether I could do it since I was gay. By that time, they knew. And they felt that people uh, couldn't do business as well. I mean, it's all nonsense. Right. It's nonsense. <laughs> and hopefully it's changing. Well, I, as you recall, in the book, there is this instant, you know, I'm now employed by an ad agency. I'm on my way to becoming the creative director there. And, but there were uh, clients who were very conservative, and, uh, and just a list of them. So I had to be very careful. However, I also became a painter while I was an executive. I had my first one-man show in New York in a New York gallery while I was a VP, creative director of an ad agency, unheard of. So the New York Times got wind of it, and they wanted to write an article about me, so, um, which uh, I allowed them to do, and this woman who, oh, and before the interview, I said, Alan, you know, she's going to ask me something about how I live, or who I, you know, whatever, my living circumstances. And they wanted to take a picture of me in my apartment, in my studio, and all that. And I said, what do I say when uh, she asked that question? And we looked at each other, and I said, you know, I think I'm going to tell the truth. And Alan agreed. Alan was then working for David Susskind, again, very, you know, not exactly homophobic, but yes, homophobic. homophobic. So um, most people were. In those days. I mean, it was so a very homophobic. So time. she did. There was this interview, and she asked the question, "Do you live here?" You know, Love and I said, "No, I live here. I share this apartment with Alan Chain, producer for David Susskind." Well, the article was the in those days it was like one page. It was the, almost the entire page, pictures of me, in, and that statement was in it. And the next day I went to work in my agency, and no one said a word. Not a word, it's like the article will never happen. It's a big deal. Alan had the same reaction. No one said anything. Suskind certainly never said anything, and he could have. Anybody could have. They could have said, isn't it great? The silence was like thunder. You know? mm -hmm. was, that, was it liberating to speak openly about your relationship, or was this, the reaction so stressful that, that you regretted it? No, we never regretted it. We no. decided to do it, and we did it. But we realized it was the first time the New York Times had ever talked about men living together. 
And it was uh, <laughs> now, and that's, that's why I think people were startled now because you have your picture in the stars. You get and married, you're in the all these fantastic I them every weekend. Every weekend. It's it's guys, you know, getting married, it's wonderful. Was there a point, or, or was that the point at which you said, enough, we're, we're just going to be out with everyone? He never said enough. He, we never said enough. He, we really didn't. We always lived, what should I say, not cautiously, but we lived our life really behind locked doors. Kept very... We never hit people in the head. No. With it. It's just the way we're doing now. I mean, we made a decision to do it, and now we do it. And, you know, uh, the butcher in the market comes up and says, I read your book, and it gave me goosebumps. And we think, uh, the butcher is reading about our sex life, in a way. You know, it's very strange. Or uh, a woman in the bookshop, an older woman, said to me, you know, I, I'm reading your book. She said, I'm so interested in reading about other people's lifestyles that I would dream of doing. <laughs> you know, so there, these people, it's a different world. It's a different world for us. They're coming out of the bushes. This little guy who works in our local eatery comes out and says, my brother came out at 32. My other brother came out at 18. I'm not gay, but wow. He says, love is love, and I'm so happy. I only wish that they have a relationship like you do, guys. But we decided it's that, just that we wanted to tell. Everyone seems to want to confess to us now. Well, no, but we, we decided we wanted to tell the true story about our, of a relationship that lasts as long. And, and if it was going to be true, we had to really go all out with it. So we did. That uh, the openness in the book, it's it's there's quite a contrast between how freely you talk about the people and your relationships with, with each other and with other people over the years. There's a contrast between that openness and the um, caution that you have to exercise earlier in your relationship. Well, we got older and we also And um, things were changing. Yeah. Politically and so forth. We were aware of that. And, so and also, we were dedicated to each other. And once we realized that, and realized that we were going to spend our lives together, I think we were much more... Oh, you know, happened. it was interesting to us later on, we're going way up to now, which is why we kind of wrote the book. Uh, we talk about, you know, the, the Joan Rivers thing and the dinner party in which they went around the table. Do you remember that? I think it's an acknowledgement. And Joan, uh, she's an old friend of ours from Los Angeles, and she has a country house near us here. And so she had a Christmas party, and she went around the table, and she said, you know, oh, uh, we're going to all say what we're grateful for. Do you remember this at all? And so she, uh, everyone groans and said, no, 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 we don't want to do that. She said, no, 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 I insist, insist. So everyone went around and said, I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for my puppy dog. I'm grateful for this. And then they came to Alan. She came to Alan, and Alan said, I'm grateful that I've been with Norman for 50 years. Everyone I actually said I'm grateful that Norman and I have been together for 50 years, not that I've been with Norman. <laughs> Quite a difference. Okay, so everyone was in shock at how old we were, we think, first. And then someone came up and said, you guys are really, I've been with my partner for 18 years, you guys are role models. How did you, you know, that sort of thing. He said we were an inspiration. Inspiration. That was a sure. word that really got us to write the book. Because we thought if we could, I mean, we're not an inspiration, but we thought at least if we could show young people who don't believe in long-term relations. I think also, Matt, we have to say that we didn't turn, we didn't mean it to be a serious book. So we talk about funny things, we talk about celebrities that we know and Hollywood and the art world, and, you know, so it, we hope it's interesting. But we hoped underneath it all there would be a, a sense that this kind of relationship can work. You know, it, it is very entertaining to have the story of your, of your really lovely relationship um, mixed in with uh, quite a lot of fascinating um, backstory about these people that you're working with, and both on Broadway and in, in Hollywood. Was it was it fun to revisit those relationships? Was it stressful or difficult? Some of the things were stressful because we took each other things we'd never known. And and yeah, but you're talking you're talking about the celebrity the celebrity or, stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's it, it's it's quite revealing in some parts. There, for example, when when you go backstage and, and meet Lena Horne again many years later, that was very disturbed. I was from that. That was very disturbed. Because I really had loved her, and she, I thought, had liked me enormously, and we had a wonderful relationship. 
And then, because she changed so in her politics and her life, and... Uh, well, Alan became the enemy in a funny way because of Congress she made in terms of her... And I think she related me to the whole thing of they didn't give her showboat, which is a big thing in her life, and she didn't get Julie in showboat. And she felt that now I was part of the movies, Warner Brothers, but I wasn't. I was you know, the line was, television. when we walked, went back there, she said, hey, Mr. Mogul, how come you never gave me any work? So she absolutely was transferring her anger at Louis B. Mayer or whoever it was, it was then. It was a bit of a shock. Alan. It was a bit of a shock. It's not all easy. I mean, any of those relationships are complicated. Hmm. And I hope we've done hmm. that in the book. I mean, I, I think we've shown that. And then there, there are other relationships that... I mean, the, the, your, your affection for some of these people is, is so clear. You're, the way you speak about Rock Hudson, for example. Uh, that, was a, that was an extraordinary friendship that came out because of our own disaster with, with the fire, the burning down of the house, and how generous he was to us, who we really didn't know very well at all. And then the ensuing friendship, and then watching him die of AIDS. It was a a really condensed period of... Uh, and he was a wonderful man, and very generous, and very sweet. We never were the closest friends with him, so, I'm, you know, we're not talking as if you were our best friend. He wasn't. But he was good to everyone. He just was a decent, good man. We had a lot of problems, I know, but we all have problems. You have a, a very moving line in the book uh, uh, during the AIDS crisis when you refer to the community as, as a threatened fraternity. I'm wondering, was there a sense of unity that emerged from the crisis that, that hadn't been there before? I don't quite think that. I think it began then. I think people began to grow together. But, you know, Hollywood is a tough place. People are very competitive. And I think the AIDS thing may have helped them grow together as, as they worried about their friends. Because we were still very frightened. We weren't yeah. quite sure what we were dealing with. No, and remember, it did take a while before anybody knew what was going on. I mean, we had dinners in which people weren't feeling well, and, and one guy said, I just have these rabbits, and I know it's from the rabbits that I'm using. So it was a, a very mysterious time. And a few, of course, were there, but this is, what, the early 80s? I mean, Rock, when, when he was already sort of going, came to dinner one night, and he couldn't believe what he looked like, for starters, and then we were... We were going to throw all the glasses and the dishes out that he had we, touched. We, we didn't, didn't know, know what it was. No one knew what, how to behave in those things. But certainly, as you lost dear friends, I mean, there was it, it, people did grow together in their love of the people who were dying. It was it was a difficult time. That affected us certainly, but the relationship itself, I think, was so solid at that time. It went through a few bumps later on, but that's true of everyone. Mm. And, and so, and then 2004 comes along, and um, so much has changed. And that's when you decide that uh, all of a sudden you find yourself in, in Nantucket on a beach, about to be married to each other. What what changed? What made you feel that that was the right time to get married? You want to say that? It came about in a less romantic way because uh, we had met this a judge, a liberal judge uh, from Boston. And he, uh, at some uh, dinner party, some mutual friends, and we started talking about that. And he said, you know, you have marriage now. You have this home of time. It's legal. I suggest, for whatever state benefits you guys will get out of it or whatever, get married. And he said, they can't take that away from you. So you will, whatever. So we thought, well, why not do that? Um, so it was sort of that sort of thing. Then as we started going through, which becomes comical, getting the ring, going to Tiffany's, it starts to become a reality. Then we made the arrangements for the wedding in Nantucket, and we got the thing. And then the whole process started to happen. When we went to Nantucket and went to the town hall and asked, as we're signing marriage rights, it was very early. You know. Everyone was so nice to us. I mean, I couldn't believe Well, that. we couldn't believe that out <laughs> in the open, out in the open, we were saying we're going to get married, and they were saying, oh, that's fine, and giving us... But so, even even before the marriage, it was a bad day. It was foggy, and we started. We looked in, at you know, houses for sale, you know, uh, in windows, and we were stalling. And, and, uh, and then finally, meanwhile, the time was coming out. We were supposed to meet the, the woman. I guess about four or five o'clock, and uh, we were bickering, and we didn't know what we were doing. And we finally get back to the 
hotel, and it was going to be at the beach across from the hotel. Just the two of us, a photographer crew, we were there, and this woman, the minister. And she shows up in a long black dress, streaming red hair, very dramatic looking. Went across the street in the gloom, and then we are standing in the spot where we could to go through this ceremony, and the sun comes up, literally. And suddenly it's beautiful. And um, she says to the two of us, now come close, grab each other's hand, and look into each other's eyes. And at that moment, you really see each other for a moment in how many years we've been together, and the aging faces, and the beauty of the day, and the preciousness of this time. Alan burst into tears, ran to the ocean, and I ran after him and comforted him and brought it back. It was so moving. Um, what a, the ritual, the marriage, the being out there in the open, the sun shining, beneficently. Well, the amazing thing was, being, was being out in the world. It was, we weren't behind closed doors. It, saying, it was a total revelation to us. And also we had done it because we finally felt we should put our money where our mouth was. We began to hear of people. We had a few friends who got married. We thought... If we believe in this, if we believe in this relationship, we have to take the next step, which is to have it legalized and be equal to other people. And we had never been activists in any way, but we began to feel we must take our role in this. And one of the ways we feel people should do it is by getting married. We're very much in favor of that, not for people who don't love each other, certainly, and not for people who doubt that they should get married, but for people who are really committed, I think it's a step forward. We, we know we have some, we read about Brad Pitt, which is admirable in a way, saying, well, I'm not going to get married until every friend I have in the world can get equal marriage. Well, false. I mean, the fact is, every step we take is wonderful and is showing the world that we are going to someday be equal. Not probably while we live, but and then of course you do, we're so aware that it, with every forward step, you have a self-righteous right wing trying to beat it back and create, you know, constitutional amendments and all that stuff that they're trying to do to keep us from having equality. But all, all the problems that we have as a couple, a gay couple, still exist. We can't. Leave money to each other without paying enormous taxes. All the things that you. And if we leave this, we don't have to go. I take my, you know, the power of attorney and all that stuff. We we have to do. You know all of those. Well, Alan Shane and Norman Sunshine, it's been such a pleasure. The book is Double Life: A Love Story from Broadway to Hollywood. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you.